So hello Sounds everybody good. and welcome to another debate night. But even though we've got a regular panel, we have a special guest of honour. So who's this guest of honour, I wonder? Ah, I, I didn't want to presume that you were talking about me, but uh, hello, ladies and gentlemen. It is, of course, your friend Mike Brady from Ocean Liner Designs. I'm a uh, presenter and producer from the YouTube channel, uh, the eponymous YouTube channel, um, big maritime nerd and, and uh, professional enthusiastic enthusiast. And I'm very pleased to be here to join you all. It's a great for you to be here, Mike, because as well, we are going to be reacting to this real-time syncing of the Empress of Ireland video. Yeah, so it's been really good fun and it's a really good um, time just to have a sit down and talk about the Empress of Ireland because you recently did a new documentary as well about the mm -hmm. history of the ship. Yeah, that's right. We had a, a whole... Um suite of of uh content for the empress so we we put out a documentary that was about an hour long and then the the real-time syncing that we followed up with because the animations that um jack gibson who animates for the channel uh put together were were so shocking and amazing and i really wanted to convey that sense of how quickly the ship sank so we we put up a real time and that is the fastest 14 minutes that you'll ever watch it's just incredible i mean i was really quite surprised though because it was like short the length of time as the lusitania and um it, it's such a shame jack can't be with us today because it, i mean he he did all of this as well especially with the other two videos of titanic and lusitania but jack if you are watching we're still thinking of you and <laughs> we're just giving you a big hi but then also we have Tony, who's recently joined us as well. Tony, hello. Hello. <laughs> and it's great to have you as well, Tony. And then, of course, we have DK, we have Hannah, and we have Plo as well. And I think... Hello. I, hello. And I think we've got everyone here. So I think without further ado, I think we'll go get started. Now, I won't be speaking a lot on this one because I don't know much about the Empress of Ireland as much. But I think, to be fair, I'm going to let everyone just to narrate and talk to the side, especially Mike, since he knows um, the research of the Empress of Ireland very well. So I'm staying back for this one this time. But when everyone's ready, we are going to be ready, steady, go. Oh, yeah, here we go. Right. So, Mike, can you take us through about what happened before um, the collision happened? Yeah, so it's it's really early in the morning on May 29th, um, as you can see. The Empress was outbound from Quebec, and uh, she's sailing upriver. And it's someone on the channel comments said it was actually it's more like an inland sea. The the river's insane. I think at its widest point, it's something like 70 or 80 kilometers across. So it is quite a significant body of water. So it's not not as um it's not a small river by any stretch. So the Empress um, is steaming upstream. She's already uh, got rid of the pilot and her last mail um, off Father Point, and she is now um, heading outbound when a steamer is spotted off in the distance. There's some conjecture over who spotted who first and on what side they were, but as is often uh, the case with the St. Lawrence River, a dense cloud of uh, fog has rolled in out of nowhere and resulted in zero visibility and captain kendall henry kendall who's the, the master of empress decides it prudent to stop and he does so by actually putting his engines astern and that is bringing his ship which had a little bit of headway obviously these are big very heavy ships um brings it to a slow but sure stop and through the fog you'll see he'll start blasting his his whistles and his foghorn to alert this other captain that he has stopped and so he's communicating that way and is kind of hoping in his mind that the vessels will pass um, with plenty of space to spare. So it was a, a tense moment aboard the bridge of the Empress of Ireland. look like it, it's completely tense especially she's come to a complete halt now and dk i believe you have a model of the empress of ireland that's with you right now well actually technically no because his stop break was completely out of it so i think for this one i'm just going to use my uh, titanic and lusitania ones just to kind of uh just kind of at a scale so basically 
the Empress of Ireland. Now, pretend my uh, Titanic model is the uh, Empress of Ireland, which basically is just sailing away just slowly, but they have not stopped whatsoever. And even though they, they have blasted their foghorns, and as we can see out in the distance, we got the Storstad actually coming up as we speak. Just coming right out of the distance. Just basically heading towards the Empress of Ireland. Now, they haven't seen it yet due to the fog, but once the Storstad got a little bit too close, there's one of the foghorns basically alerting them of their presence, which basically means, okay, we gotta back the ship up, but unfortunately, they didn't back it up in time, and instead just impaled the side of the ship. Yeah, Storstad was loaded down with about 11,000 tons of coal, and, um... Something like that has just got such momentum, there's just no stopping it. You can see out of nowhere um, she came. It's, it's really unclear if the Empress was stopped or slowly drifting ahead at one or two knots. Um, there are conflicting accounts, but regardless, there was not enough headway to clear Storstad. And she hits in the worst possible, possible place between the two smokestacks, right in the heart, like the beating heart of the Empress, straight through the boiler rooms between the two bulk, uh, sorry, the bulkhead that separates the two compartments there, and there immediately, it's not even like a slow ingress of water, it's just... No. There is, suddenly there is river outside the ship, and then there is river inside the ship. It should have been survivable to have both boiler rooms flooded with, like, a very minimal margin of reserve buoyancy, but um, getting the watertight doors closed would be kind of an insurmountable task, that and the open portholes. Yeah, it's an interesting point. The, the portholes, um, the night stewards are interesting people because they had a couple of jobs. So they were securing, one of those was securing the portholes every night, apparently. Yeah. Part of their role was to make sure that portholes were closed as per regulation before passengers went to bed. But uh, although this was kind of early summer, um, it might have been a bit warm on board. Um, we know that the thermo tanks that operate the, the, the um, heating inside these ships, they actually blew quite warm. They would put air down sometimes quite hot but like 25, 26 degrees Celsius. So it's possible passengers might have been feeling a bit stuffy, open the portholes and, you know, maybe not wanting to create any issues. A lot of those night stewards would have said, ah, you know, they might have, might have let it go. But their other role in an emergency was to manually close the watertight doors because unlike liners like Titanic, which were of different generation, really, to the Empress of Ireland, even though Titanic did have a lot of watertight doors that needed manual closing virtually all of the Empress's doors needed um, yeah, man to be manually wound shut. And yeah. that is exactly what is happening as we speak. A lot of manual intervention required and a lot of doors didn't get shut. Mm. So I she immediately that. rolls quite heavily, you can see. There's just a huge volume of water going in. It's remarkable how quickly it happens. When you uh, mentioned the doors, um, did you mean the watertight doors? Yeah, that's right. Yeah, they were uh, in passenger spaces. They were hor uh, horizontally closing. So they're on tracks that ran uh, across the width of the ship instead of the kind of what you're used to seeing in, say, the film Titanic, where down in the machine spaces they could close from top down, which means that once the Empress assumes this list of 5, 10, 15 degrees, it's quite difficult to actually crank these doors shut up against... The roll of the of the vessel and then when you think that on the low side on the on the starboard side there this is the kind of scene you'd be seeing you know mountains of water like a tidal wave surging inside it's horrifying to imagine these people struggling to crank these doors shut with water coming up around their their ankles and then their knees you know yeah just by luck that they happen to close right to left yeah And Tony was talking about open portholes. You can already see we've actually, you know, what we're just a couple minutes in, and we've already lost an entire row of uh, portholes below below the waterline, just like that. So, um, what is remarkable about this whole incident is that the crew was remarkably well drilled, and Kendall kept a pretty tight ship. So, radial davits, these kinds of lifeboat um, cranes very finicky very very clumsy um, 
you have to swing one side of the lifeboat out first and then the other side and they're, they're just really kind of they've been around for you know hundreds of years they were not particularly advanced but still these guys got uh five or six boats clear and away some of the, one or two of them did flip or uh capsize just in the chaos of it but this remarkably drilled crew got their boats out and were working on it when the steam ran out and the lights cut off and that was really the death knell for anybody who hadn't yet made it out of the bowels of the ship because not only are they now kind of on unsure footing but it's pitch black I I just can't imagine it, it's just truly horrifying first four minutes, I think four or five minutes the lights cut out For some reason, the book I was reading said eight minutes, but to me that seemed too long. I don't know where they got that. I don't think that's right. Yeah, I think within eight minutes, or eight to ten minutes, she had uh, rolled. So my, the yeah. timeline in my head was like four or five minutes, her lights are out. By ten minutes, she's rolled onto her side, and about four minutes later, she was on the on the riverbed. That's boat one. That's and there are conflicting accounts from passengers and survivors about what happened to the different boats, but it seems that boat one was one that may have broken free of her chocks while they were attempting lowering, and then flipped and, and let quite a few passengers out into the water. Like the same with the Lusitania. Yeah. And, and mind you, um, same type of davit. There's, a, there's this video I always recommend people watch of the Aquitania doing a lifeboat emergency drill, and even in drill conditions these boats are just kind of jerking down and bouncing all over the place and going down unevenly and yeah the the well and davit which titanic was equipped with was much 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 safer you mentioned aquitania of course aquitania departed on its maiden voyage the day after the empress of ireland sank that was a great point. Yeah, good, good fact. Yeah, here's another one that flips, and you've only got two points of contact there with the falls. It's very easy in, in the in the rush for these boats to to tip. The the problem with the way that the Empress is sinking here as well, you can actually just see Storstad still standing too out in the distance. Storstad wasn't yet sure that their ship wasn't sinking. Um, the issue here being that the more the faster the Empress goes and the more the ship more of the ship disappears the faster it sinks it's as simple as that because now we're about to have water pouring into the open promenades that means it's surging through ventilator heads and and doors and things so it's really like it's just sinking faster and faster and faster that's kind of like a feedback loop but still remarkable in time we've just been sitting here talking that these sailors have been able to get these boats rigged uncovered um and then over the side full full with passengers and are lowering them. Remarkably well-drilled crew. So were these boats all filled to full capacity? There was... It, it was just a matter of getting whoever was on hand in um, they, I, I'm not entirely sure on if they were overfilled or, or what have you. These were big steel boats. It's interesting. They weren't clinker-built wooden boats. They're made out of steel and um, they had a, a pretty significant capacity. They're also extremely heavy by themselves. Um, but they got good numbers of people in it. This isn't like Titanic where you had one boat launched with twenty odd. You know, this was quite a desperate situation. So they did fill them up and get them away. I don't, I don't know exactly that they were full up to the you know to the gunnels, but they were they got a significant amount of people into them which again is extremely impressive given the circumstances you can just see there the lower promenade deck is now dipping in and this is like the the death knell for this ship because what's about to happen is you can see boat 11 is still up on the on the davits there and um unfortunately uh sorry i think that might be boat five boat five just gets away but boat 11 wrong place wrong time uh when the ship eventually rolls over uh, boat 11 is is destroyed by it
Okay, so it says there was a muffled explosion. Can anyone explain what happened? My best Stephen. guess is they probably, they possibly have not uh, vented out the steam because of due to the water and also the contact with the hot boilers and the cold water just makes a deadly explosion. Yeah, we know that the not, that boiler crews okay. didn't have time to shut the doors even, so they, they just got up and out. Um, yeah. Yeah. There were some survivors from the Stokeholds, but not all of them. So it's interesting that with the roll here, a lot of pieces of equipment broke free, and I believe that um, one of the ship's officers, potentially Jones, I think, was crushed by one of the falling cargo derricks. As it broke free of its mouth. Just everything think, uh, just held onto the deck just breaks free. Didn't Joan survive? Oh, <laughs> I don't think of another officer. Think, so. Might have been uh, Chief Officer Deed, or. No, I'm not certain. No, I'd probably tell you. You know I'm more of it. More of it uh, like, Yeah, sorry, you're right. I was thinking of um, Chief Officer Steed, Mansfield Steed, whereas uh, First Officer Jones did survive. Um, but yeah, all this, all these pieces of equipment breaking free, collapsibles, you know, these boats that had been yeah. kind of stuffed onto the decks in the wake of Titanic sinking, just coming loose and falling, raining, like this kind of like deadly, deadly uh, heavy rain, you know, tons and tons of stuff are suddenly broken loose and, and rained down on the heads of these passengers as they're in the water. It's like the final final blow. Truly horrifying. You know how surreal this site is, you know, the ship is now totally rolled over. One, one interesting um, fact that we picked up while we were animating and researching this was the, um, the life buoys we had a, a chemical um, substance on them that would illuminate at night time so it cast the whole thing in this weird bluish glow um, as they contacted the water and lit up So you've got, yeah, clumps of passengers in the dozens um, on the port side of the hull. Presumably some who'd clung to the railings and maybe um, stepped over. But um, what kind of happens next is pretty horrifying. A lot of people actually were woken up, not by the impact or anything, but by the the rolling of the ship, because the, the impact was very slight. And some of them tried to crawl out through portholes and the staterooms if they're on the port side of the ship they were trying to trying to get their way through but portholes on ships are very narrow you know they're between 8 to 12 inches across on the hulls of ships and that, that's really difficult to squeeze through Amazing shot, isn't it? It's just so surreal. Oh, that's a pretty incredible shot, really. I mean, when I first saw it, yeah. my stomach dropped completely. And it's still going. It's really still going. How Jack does it, I don't know. Hmm. Yeah, you know, it's very. You know, at this point, the the vessel was still very buoyant. I mean, on the port side, she still had a lot of a lot of air and so as the the um, caption says you know a lot of people thought that she'd hit the river bottom but as I was uh, saying earlier this is a very very big body of water and there was actually still something like a hundred feet um, from the Empress's hull to the to the river bottom so she was going down and um, 
very gradual, but it was kind of like they said it was like a, the tide coming in at the beach where each wave lapped slightly higher than the last. That's all it took. Oh, that was a very fast 14 minutes. Now, I heard that it took um, a while to get help and then there were other ships that came by to rescue them. Was that right? Yeah, well, one of the, the remarkable true stories of the Empress's... Um, wireless operator just immediately grasped the gravity of the situation and we know the power went out very quickly so he had about four or five minutes to organize a rescue which he did and the pilot cut a eureka which had actually last seen the empress um by the time the empress had sunk the pirate pilot cut a eureka and the lady um the lady, lady gray, evelyn yeah lady evelyn thank you yeah, the lady evelyn was the other vessel the lady gray they were already making steam and um on route and so they got there not not too long by early morning to assist. But of course, Storstad, who had her bow crushed, was uh, had figured they weren't sinking and put their boats into the water and, and went to the rescue um, first. So she took on more of the passengers initially than than the rescue vessels. You can see here the the Eureka has just arrived the next morning. So yeah, a very bleak disaster. There's not that kind of um, oh, yeah. gallantry or heroism, you know? Oh yeah. No, it's very fast and harrowing. Yeah. A little bit similar to the Andrea Doria disaster as well, which actually happened years later. Yeah, and curiously, a lot of these incidents seem to involve uh, Scandinavian ships. No, no uh, offense to our Scandinavian friends, of course, but Storstad was Norwegian. Um, Stockholm was Swedish. That was the ship that hit Andrea Doria. Yeah, it's, you know, and it's very similar conditions, right? Foggy. Um, you would have thought that having radar would have, would have helped by the time Andrea Doria was around in the 50s, 1956. But, but no, it's still, it's still a, a concern. It just takes one miscommunication and, and um, these kinds of things still can happen. So it's, um, yeah, it's, uh, that's a really good point. There have been a lot of ship collisions and impacts like that, but none quite so deadly as the Empress. It was just every worst possible case scenario happened at the same time. Mm. And I know from your documentary, Mike, it... it... It's um, what, what I'm trying to find the right words to put this because it is so hard to explain. It's kind of like it was the worst disaster for the Canadians since the Titanic. So it's Canada's version of Titanic. Yeah, I mean, you know, you had a whole contingent of um, Salvation Army band members wiped out. You had the darlings of stage and screen. You had, um, yeah, it, it, it was felt around the world. I mean, it was reported on. I was checking newspapers all the way down here and... Melbourne, it was in the news the next day. Um, oh, sure. Yeah, but it just uh, was, was buried pretty much by the, the outbreak of the war and um, all, all, all but forgotten about, really. It kind of, uh, yeah, disappeared into more like local kind of legend, local knowledge and local history. But it's only more recently, I think, that interest has, has revived in it, for the better, of course. I mean, after talking about that, really... You could just feel that you're in the moment and you're trying to sink everything in, even if you've watched it plenty of times. And I feel feel like it, it's still that way, really. And Jack's animation is a really good example of trying to get you into that moment. So I definitely think it, it's been really, really good. And I, I know I'm so speechless because I don't really know what to say. I think it, it's just... It's just one of those things that was very well done. I, I think I'll put it into the, that context, really. What was I going to say? The, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm sorry I got the officer's name wrong. Again, you guys know I'm, I'm, a, I'm a ship guy. I'm a, a rivets and, and bolts, nuts and bolts kind of guy. Yeah, I, 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 if, I don't know if you wanted to wrap it up or if you want to do a quick fly around. Like, I'd be interested. You guys are like Tony and DK and um, 
barbecue cat. I don't know your first name. I'm sorry, but no. we're all. My, my name's uh, Hannah. Oh, Hannah, brilliant. Yeah, Hannah. You know, we're all um, maritime enthusiasts. I mean, it's interesting. What, what if you guys had any observations on? You know, again, like uh, Sez was saying, you know, Lusitania is down in 18 minutes. Titanic, you know, two two hours odd. You know, what are some things that you picked up on just having watched that? Uh, I just wanted to see if you had any, like, interesting thoughts or observations on it in comparison to other disasters. That's a really good idea, Mike. Um, I think, who should I have brave enough to go first? DK, I'm oh, looking at you, buddy. <laughs> DK already drew parallels with Andrea Doria. Yeah. Yeah, with the uh, Andrea Doria in Stockholm, and then we got the... Uh, the Storstad and the Empress of Ireland. Those two disasters just happen. It's basically like a mirror of itself. Norwegian, well, Here's Swedish. an interesting one for you. The SS Malolo. Um, almost identical. She was a Matson lighter. And she was on her sea okay. trials in uh, 1926, 1927. And she entered fog off, uh, I think it was Nantucket. Or in the same, very, very similar space, you know, out of, out of um, on the East Coast. And a, uh, a, a, a Scandinavian freighter out of nowhere nailed her um, dead center. But because this, this ship had been so, so, so over-designed by William Francis Gibbs, who famously went on to design the United States, the SS America, she took on about 6,000 tons of water and dipped way down and lost all her freeboard but didn't sink and made it back into um, the harbour safe and sound and then was re repaired and went on a maiden voyage. Um, but very, very famously, I think it was the Admiral, Admiral Benson said that were it, were it another ship, it would have sunk. But just the fact that all these lessons and one of the lessons, one of the disasters that directly inspired William Francis Gibbs designing Malolo was the Empress of Ireland. It had happened while he was a, a young man and he remembered it. And um, his, the ship that he designed specifically to survive that kind of disaster encountered that exact disaster and made it through. I think that was a good point there, Mike. I, I, I didn't really know what to say on that, really. I think you've got everyone hooked. <laughs> yeah, Malolo's a great story. It's on a sea trial as well. It's remarkable. Yeah, it's a um, Norwegian freighter, the Jacob Christensen. So I don't know what it is about these, uh, <laughs> these Norwegians. <laughs> But um, yeah, it's obviously a happier story with Malolo. There were no no casualties, but um, yeah, you know these are the lessons that are taken from from these disasters. At the very least, designers learned things, and um, yeah, came away. You know, the maritime industry came away all the the better for it. But it's just tragic that it had, these are hard learned lessons. You know, hundreds, if not thousands, of lives. DK, I know you've got your Lusitania model. Was there anything you wanted to share about? you know, the ships rolling onto the one side, really, when they sank. Because the Empress of Ireland and the Lusitania, the way that they sank was quite similar. Yeah, basically, they were where the Empress of Ireland hit was basically on the, on the back side, where basically the boilers are. And just because of, just because of that impact alone, it just rolls on its side. Now, for the Empress of Ireland, the situation for that was if when they were going into fog, they had to close up at least one watertight compartment door. Now, correct me if I'm wrong on that one. Now, for Lusitania, basically, all the uh, watertight compartment doors were open around that time frame, and once that torpedo hit, it just uh, kind of gave it a bloody nose. But basically, at the end of it, secondary explosion, and then all of a sudden, yep, it's on its side. There was like two differences between them two, really. Since we did the Lusitania sinking animation uh, debate night last time, was it like really different, especially between like those time lengths of the sinking and then given the position that the ship actually sank in like almost the same position as each other? Yeah, you know, there's some interesting similarities between design here that um, the employment of longitudinal bulkheads is something that 
is so you know watertight bulkheads traditionally transverse bulkheads cut the ship up like a loaf of bread if you were to think of it that way they run across the width longitudinal bulkheads run down the length of the ship um and yeah you would think that segmenting the ship into more more pieces like that would obviously prevent flooding but um one of the unintended side effects of that as in the case of lusitania was that if you have a longitudinal bulkhead separating the compartment then that one section of the ship is the one that's flooding and it's not actually the water isn't spilling and kind of evening out or counter flooding if you will or it, it, it as on titanic she didn't employ longitudinal bulkheads in her watertight compartment system therefore she sank on a relatively even even keel and so what lusitania and the empress have in common is use of um these these um longitudinal bulkheads here and there and uh not not as much a, a margin of stability during sinking Tony had a really interesting point earlier when he was talking about the Empress's boiler rooms. Um, she was designed to stay afloat with two compartments flooded, but with a very, very small margin of error. And that was it's probably looked at as a, as a design flaw. Hey, Tony, I, I think that's come up recently as maybe more of a, an issue with the ship. Perhaps, yeah. Well, you know, William Francis Gibbs, for example, would have been screaming if his designers brought him that and said, this is the margin for error, because the boiler and engine rooms are just this cavernous space in the ship that if those are the ones that are filled with water, you want to have or account for, you know, say you, you've got longitudinal bulkheads, one side of your ship is flooding. It means that side is going to be lower in the water. You would, you would want to be thinking as a design team that, okay, worst case scenario, we have portholes open, then they're flooding the ship as well, which means now that side is going to to roll. Um, yeah, yeah, you have so to account yeah, for things yeah. not going perfectly, and maybe pad the margin a bit more. Ideally, yeah, yeah, completely right. So yeah, there are similarities there. I think the um, longitudinal bulkheads played played a role, uh, but in theory, they're a great idea. I mean, a, a lot of liners had them, you know. Uh, yeah, I mean, just intuitively, you think of it as protecting you know, the the machinery and the internals and. But just the asymmetric flooding can be a hazard. Yeah, exactly right. And it's, it's you know, again, Britannic is an interesting point, uh, a, a contrast to Lusitania, where she also suffers a mine detonation in virtually the same location, really. Very, very, mm -hmm. very similar spot. Mm -hmm. um, but doesn't roll and takes quite some time to sink. Why? Why is that the case? I think one of these two guys could answer that. Tony? <laughs> well, I mean, Britannic did have an inner skin, but it didn't rise to the level of having large longitudinal you know, com compartmentation. So the water would even out a, a bit more in the case of Britannic. Yeah, and also um, on Britannic, uh, I think the electric... Watertight doors obviously help stem flooding for some time. And you've got a bigger ship. That also plays into it. She's about 10,000 tons larger. Right. But, yeah, I think it's this... Um, if you've got flooding, flooding on one side only, then that side is sinking lower. And like we were explaining earlier, there's a direct relationship between how much of the vessel is going underwater and how quickly it's flooding. Like, there's no, there's no coincidence that Titanic, for example, took a very, very, very long time to get its bow into the water, but as soon as the, the bow was under, suddenly those huge cargo hatches and ventilators and everything, they're all letting water in, and that was the point at which the final plunge started. With Lusitania, I think, you had such a severe list that by the time the promenades were exposed to the water, um, that, was, that was it. You know, she was going down very, very quickly. Whereas Britannic, even though all these portholes were left open because the nurses and staff were airing out the, the hospital wards, um, it, it took a little longer because less of the ship, because the list was much less significant, um, less of the ship was being dipped underwater and there was less opportunity for water to cascade down vent heads and things like that towards the end mm. it just took a little more time it's interesting though comparing the two you, people I, I don't mean to go on to titanic but people you know often misunderstand the the how safe those ships actually were and how well designed they were and both titanic and britannic proved it by not sinking in in 20 minutes or half an hour you know well, that's a fair point i mean some people are of the perspective that like 
Titanic's design was massively bungled or something, but <laughs> really, it was just a very, very strange set of circumstances that did it in. It was fairly well designed with a lot of redundancies and safety features, really. And the, we also think of the Impress of Ireland as being small. It was 14,000, about 14,200 gross registered tons, but just a few years earlier, mm -hmm. very, very a short amount of time, less than 10 years, maybe five to 10 years earlier, she would have been by far the largest ship in the world. So, sure. But by 1907, she was a mid-sized, you know. So this is the kind of technological leap forward that we're talking about. And so when we're talking about design teams, I mean, it's, I, I, it's hard to be too critical of them because when, when they're talking about margin of error for flotation and that kind of thing, none of these disasters had really happened yet. You know, a lot of ship sinkings mm -hmm. were from groundings. Um, you know, in the past, there had been a lot of iceberg collisions, but ships would just simply disappear at sea and they were presumed to have hit an iceberg back in the days of sail. So a lot of these, sure. these yeah, mishaps, like no one had encountered mines or torpedoes before. That was a new piece of technology. Um, how do you design a ship against a torpedo or a mine? If you've never encountered one, you have no idea how they work. You know, it's just remarkable. So I think it was, a, yeah, it was an inno innovative, you know, this was still the early days of, of this kind of engineering. And um, unfortunately, yeah, it was ships like Empress that in theory were safe, but in practice, there were situations that they just hadn't quite accounted for yet. DK, do you want to add something onto that? Yeah, I'm just surprised uh, how my, about how much safety features that we put into these ships. You just really can't predict anything that will happen to it. Like Titanic, it was predicted prior before, but nobody thought it would be a coincidental. Lusitania was just basically a uh, wrong place, wrong time with U-20. <laughs> Excuse me, had to clear my throat real quick. Empress of Ireland was just basically just something out of the blue and that just did not expect to happen. And of course, uh, Britannic was just basically uh, with a mine, just bad luck. Yeah. And Unfortunately, yeah, these uh, disasters do happen uh, <laughs> out of the blue <laughs> and unexpectedly. That's the, uh, the insidious nature of them, I feel. They're never convenient. Never convenient. Yeah. <laughs> But then we've got one more point to add, really, because um, I know that I might ask this question before we wrap it up. But um, I couldn't help but with the collision between the Storstad, I think that's how I pronounce it right, and yep. the Empress of Ireland. Um, yeah. The other thing that came into mind was the Olympic N Nantucket collision. And I'm, I'm sorry I got things like pronunciations wrong. <laughs> no, you did great. Oh, thanks, Mike. <laughs> So, yeah, I was wondering with, like, the two of them, compared to the Stroidstad and the Empress of Ireland, um, th there's differences between them because one sinks a big ship and then the other sinks just a, a little ship. Well, the, the, um, the thing I like to say is that ships are squishy. And I know that sounds ridiculous and a bit, a bit silly, but bear with me. Steel has a good amount of... Um, gee, my... Engine, my uh, uh, I forget elasticity. If it's elasticity or plasticity, yes. but yeah, elasticity. There you yeah. go. Yes. You know, they hog and sag as they go through the water over waves, and they, they bend and flex. And um, Steel, when it's impacted by something significant, will, will just kind of bend like wet cardboard, you know? And so you saw it with um, those great shots of Olympic after she collided with Hawk, where you've got this, yeah. you know, like almost an inch thick steel, yeah. just kind of just bent in as if it's made out of paper. My old steel yeah. has pretty good ductility and you can see that with the the hawk damage to olympic mm. now what's interesting is that so for example um yeah the nantucket lightship is a great example that was she was just cut in half um the uh, queen mary and kurosawa, kurosawa sorry the cruiser she was cut in half as well it's just yeah, it's a whole ship hms kurosawa right whereas um Storstad, it was not she was smaller than Empress, but by no means a small ship. If you look at pictures of her after the collision, you see just how much of that ship lies underwater. And it, she's a brute. I mean, that thing was just a big, heavy bruiser of a ship. And it was designed to ice break its way up the, the St. Lawrence, essentially. She was very, very heavily reinforced using a system of longitudinal reinforcement called the Isherwood Framing System, which instead of relying heavily on... Um, transverse frames as much. You had longitudinal frames, 
which really beefed this thing up. She's been described as like yeah. a cold chisel of a ship. From what and I've read, like it. Oh, go ahead. Oh no, no, you go, Tony. I'm sorry. I, I just saying from what I've read, it sliced into Empress with such ease that it was perceived as a pretty gentle collision by yeah. those who survived to report it. And that, that was the issue, is that, you know, the Empress's hull, I mean, this is, again, this is almost inch-thick steel, but uh, it didn't account for much because the store stud, being also loaded with 11,000 tonnes of coal, you've got the momentum of an absolute, I would say freight train, but it's so much bigger than a freight, freight train, you know, it's just so much momentum and um, very heavily reinforced bow. And so if you look at the damage to store stud, it looks so minor, to in comparison to what happened to the Empress. Um, and that's why nobody felt the impact. And people have criticised the animation that we put up saying, oh, how ridiculous that the Empress doesn't move or lean over or anything. But she didn't. There was just no resistance. It was like uh, sliding a knife in between someone's ribs is how um, the, the author of this, uh, this book that I, well, books that I read for research described it. Um, the worst possible ship to collide with another ship. And as, as something very similar had happened in the late 19th century where a, um, another passenger vessel was sunk in a very similar way by one of these new kind of reinforced freighters. And, um, yeah, clearly they just were not the kind of ship you wanted to encounter in a foggy, on a foggy night on the St. Lawrence River. I definitely think we'll wrap this up here because... It's perfect to end on the notes on here, really. And I think, to be fair, this is one of the best live, live streams we've ever done, really, the debate live streams, and the, because it, it was much more of a debate and discussions this time. But I know that we've got Mike to thank for. Mike, thank you so much for coming on today. And where, where can we find you for your YouTube channel? Thank you. So I didn't mean to t turn it into a Mike Brady lecture, but it was nice to, <laughs> nice to join you all. I was really hoping someone right. would disagree. We, like it. Oh, we have a little debate. You're good. <laughs> You're good. Um, you can find us over at uh, youtube.com slash at Ocean Liner Designs. Ocean Liner Designs. For all your ship needs, we've got documentaries and, and videos and all kinds of things. The, the Empress documentary is one we did last month. We've got um, a couple more coming out that I think you'll all be really excited for. Uh, especially one next week about the rise of and fall actually the rise and fall of the four funneled liner that'll have all your fan favorites mm. in it so be sure to check it out and i'm sure you'll enjoy it oh yeah I'm definitely nice. looking forward to that <laughs> yeah definitely <laughs> yeah and then thanks so much for having me Oh, you're welcome, Mike. And then also we've got to say a big, huge thank you to Tony. Tony, I know you, you, um, you, you had a good time, really, for your first time. How was it for you? Oh, I enjoyed it. I don't think I added much. And actually, I, I wasn't able to watch the stream, so I had to try to bring it up on my phone and sync it up. I, I don't think I did very well. So if my comments seemed out of place, that's, that might be why. I'll blame it on that. Oh, no, you're good, Tony. You're all right. And now also we've got to say a massive big thank you to Hannah for providing the recording for us. And then DK as well. And then Plo. And then Imperium. I'm sorry that I didn't really include you before, but Imperium, thank you so much for coming on. And until then, we will... If you enjoyed this episode, please like and subscribe for future videos. Until next time, this has been History Inside a Nutshell, departing from the dogs. Thank you so much for all of your support and enjoy the rest of your voyage.